So we just reviewed the anatomy of the ear. Hopefully you remember that from the hour that it's been since lunch started and how hearing works and how balance works, and head position and rotational momentum, uh, how your tectorial membrane works versus your tympanic membrane, which is an entirely different structure. Next pointer. Okay. Uh, so, and here's our vertigo. We kind of discussed this as a class, but Honestly, all vertigo is is a mismatch between what is happening in your inner ear, what is happening in your vestibular system versus what is happening to your eyes. That's one of the reasons they say if you're car sick, you should look out the window and look towards the mountains. Establish something visual that actually matches what's physically happening to you. I know that's not going to work for everybody, but <laughs> uh, again, if you're having a problem with an otolith, if you're having a problem with your eyes that happened first, and led to the vertigo, then um, that's not going to be as effective. So the treatment would be correcting the cause, whatever that may be. For hearing impairment, so hearing loss, like as you know, it's going to start from that uh, oval window and it's going to work its way down. So you're going to lose higher pitched sounds first, more than likely. If somebody is slowly losing their hearing, it may not be very evident that they're losing their hearing. They may just seem inattentive or rude. They may speak out of turn in conversation. They'll turn up the volume on their devices. They may be confused. Like, I thought you said this was going to be on Thursday. It's your brain uh, with your circuitry for hear hearing, it's a very complex circuit. Your brain will try to convince you that you can hear. Your brain is going to try to convince you that you can hear equally well out of both ears, even if one is gone. If it's neural hearing loss, if it's sensory neural hearing loss, your brain's going to try to compensate and convince you you're fine. Just like with your visual pathway, right? You don't know what color that wall is, but your brain has seen it and it's adding it back into your understanding. Same thing with hearing. So there's a difference between conductive hearing loss and sensory neural hearing loss, which I've already hinted at. So sensory neural would be specifically it's the cochlea or some part of that pathway back to our cranial nerve nuclei and our temporal lobe for audition, right? There's actually six nuclei on this path. It's a really complex pathway. We don't ever have to learn those six nuclei in this class, don't worry about it. But it is going from your cochlea to your medulla oblongata, all the way back up to your temporal lobe, and anywhere along that path you can have sensory neural impairment, starting from that cochlea. For conducting hearing impairment, we're talking about external or middle ear. One of them is very literal, cerumen impaction. That means too much earwax in your ear canal. And I actually had a student who had this. Uh, in AMP1 and 2, we actually did fine. And then I saw him again in court four, and he's like, Reeves, I had a sermon infection, and I've never heard you before. <laughs> I couldn't hear you in AMP1 and AMP2. Like, okay. <laughs> he had it taken care of, and he's like, everything's really loud now. Okay. I'm glad he got it fixed, and I don't know how he succeeded without being able to hear me, but awesome job. Um, a major issue is going to be in the middle ear where you have your malleus incus and stapes all in a row line. So remember, you're going to vibrate the tympanic membrane, you're going to vibrate your malleus, your incus, and then your stapes, and your stapes is going to stomp on that olive window and send those vibrations into your cochlea, right? All sound familiar? If they cannot vibrate, then you will have conducting hearing impairment, conductive hearing impairment. So. That could be from middle ear effusion. What's that middle ear connected to? Your station tube is connected to your nasopharynx. So if you have a throat infection, you can get an ear infection, a middle ear infection, that is going to limit your ossicles' ability to vibrate. Otosclerosis, uh, just like you can have problems with any other joints flexibility, these are joints between these tiny bones as well. So you can even have uh, a sort of arthritis of these bones. And that can cause stiffness, which means they can't vibrate. And then discontinuity, they can be disjointed just like any other joint in the body. 
So again, sensory neural hearing impairment is from the cochlea on back to that temporal lobe, and your brain is going to convince you that you can hear just fine. We've sort of addressed this already. Um, that kind of uh, ankylosing of ossicles can happen as well, like I said, with the arthritis of ossicles, similar process. You do tend to lose high pitches first, low pitches later. Otitis media is inflammation of the middle ear, and we've already mentioned this, but it's going to contribute to throat infections, and throat infections are going to impact middle ear infections. And in children, that eustachian tube is more, instead of being sort of vertical, semi-vertical, it's more horizontal, just by the size of the And it's also a lot shorter because of the size and shape of the head in children. So now your throat, your nasopharynx is right next to your middle ear, and you're just passing that infection back and forth. And that's why those kids are getting recurrent ear infections over and over again. I've heard competing things on this, I think. So you do have to equalize that air pressure between your middle ear and your throat when your ears pop in the airplane. That's what that is. I, in terms of pacifier use, I don't know what the recommendations are for that for people with frequent middle ear infections. Does anybody know? OK. So acute otitis media, when we look at the eardrum, it's going to look red and inflamed like this. Typically short duration, but if you've ever had a toddler with an ear infection, you know that that's way too long. Um, and then we could give them antibiotics, but if they're passing this infection back and forth and it's recurrent, we don't really want to give kids too many antibiotics. So sometimes we say, wait and see. And then sometimes we'll place tubes in that middle ear that will allow that effusion to drain elsewhere instead of to the nasopharynx. And so they can stop passing it back and forth. So otitis media can go from acute to chronic, lasting longer than 12 weeks, and that can eventually cause damage to the tympanic membrane, maybe even atrophy or perforation of that tympanic membrane, which again, that tympanic membrane can heal under proper circumstances. With treatments for hearing impairment, It's hearing aids first, basically. We're going to amplify sound going in first. Cochlear implants are not a standard treatment for moderate hearing loss, right? They're a last resort. When we put a cochlear implant in, we scrape out all of the remaining hair cells of the entire cochlea. And then we put the cochlear implant in. And then it's not normal hearing. It's a new form of hearing. So a cochlear implant is best for the profoundly deaf. and um, it may be more ideal if somebody's very elderly and has completely lost their hearing, maybe they might prefer a cochlear implant. We discussed this in detail in AMP2 and the clinical implications and the moral implications of the deaf community. I'm not going to rehash that all here. If anybody wants to learn about the deaf community, please see me after. Uh, and aside from hearing aids and cochlear implants, part of it is just, you know what, position them so that you, they can see your face while lit place. As people are losing their hearing and their brain is convincing them that they can hear, they may be learning to read lips through that process as well without even realizing it. Reduce background noise so that they can focus. And again, it's, it's a process. It's a continuous process. It's progressive, right? So even somebody with some degree of hearing loss can probably still hear maybe lower registers. Maybe there's some sounds that work better for them than others. My dad's had hearing loss pretty much all along. And... Um, and if I want to be taken seriously, I tend to speak in a lower register because of like growing up and like needing to be heard, I would have to speak in a lower register. Yeah. Okay, moving on from ears to eyes. All right, let's do this thing. Review some eye anatomy. Uh, which of these is the cornea? Which of these is the lens? So the lens is this little marble guy. The cornea is out here. So those are different. Both of these are things that light has to pass through. Whereas your pupil, is your pupil an anatomical structure, something you can poke at? It's a hole. 
in your iris. The iris is the pigmented portion, which is also muscular. So that's the part that's going to uh, constrict and dilate for pupillary constriction and dilation. Uh, what is going to be the structure that changes the shape of the lens? How are we going to change the shape? What's that? Which muscles? What are they called? So there are suspensory ligaments of the lens attached to Ciliary body. There we go. So the ciliary body has ciliary processes attached to suspensory ligaments. And when it actually contracts, does that make the lens flatter or rounder? Rounder. Good. It's, count, it's counterintuitive. When it contracts, it actually rounds the lens. And the job of that is to focus light on the retina. We're going to aim for this most sensitive region of the retina. What's the, aside from macula lutea, what's right in the middle of that? That's the area of highest visual acuity. Fovea centralis. Well done. And then uh, if light hits this optis, optic disc, is that going to be high visual acuity, low visual acuity? Where we it's a blind spot. Well done, Alan. So we actually have a physiological blind spot where light is hitting that optic disc, which does not have rods or cones, right? Uh, what is the name of this cavity? <laughs> nope. It's related to aqueous and vitreous humor, which is what I'm getting to next. Don't overthink it if it's positional term. Posterior cavity. Way overthinking it. And then from here and here, what is that cavity? anterior cavity. What about chambers? Does this have chambers? Nope. Does this have chambers? It's making this the what chamber? Anterior chamber and this is the posterior chamber. What fluid is in the posterior cavity? The vitreous humor is in the posterior cavity. What fluid is in the anterior cavity? Aqueous humor. Where is aqueous humor being synthesized? I taught you this in AMP2. It is, it's true. It's a structure that's up there. It's on there. Just find the right one. It's kind of a trick. Uh, we're going to the canal of Schlem, so that's the answer to the next question. Keep that one. Yep. Did have to draw this out. Yeah, so you have circulation between the posterior and anterior chamber of the anterior cavity. But where is it being synthesized? This has clinical relevance, otherwise, I wouldn't be forcing you to do this. It is the ciliary body again. Yay! So your ciliary body, in addition to having a muscular component controlling those suspensory ligaments, is also synthesizing aqueous humor. It's constantly being synthesized and it's constantly being drained through Nora. What structure? The canal of Schlem. Congratulations. So there's your canal of Schlem. It's got a more clinical name aside from canal of Schlem. But yes, we're going to need that to circulate. And just like with your ventricular circulation in your brain, this is going to have the capacity to be blocked. And that's a problem. What's up? Ouch, yes. We call that glaucoma. And we're getting to glaucoma. Uh, visual pathways, we're going to go from the retina. Uh, there's layers as well. Remember, you've got sclera, choroid, and the retina. The retina itself has nine layers. You are only responsible for three. At the most technically superficial layer of that retina, you've got your rods and cones. And those are going to send action potentials along the visual pathway. That visual pathway is going to carry, be carried back to the optic chiasm. Same side information is going to decusate to go to the contralateral side of the brain. Same side information is going to decusate across that optic chiasm. And then we're going to go through a little bit of parietal lobe and a little bit of temporal lobe right there on our way back to the occipital lobe for visual processing, which means you can have a lesion 
anywhere along here and have different visual field deficits by quadrants. This one's actually only illustrating nasal and temporal field and how you could have nasal and temporal field deficits. It's actually as far as quadrants based on this arrangement here. We did that in AMP2. If you want to spend more time on it, let me know. So with visual impairment, much like with auditory impairment, your brain sometimes is going to convince you that you can see just fine. Not necessarily. If uh, there's a visual impairment in childhood, we are talking about critical periods of neurological development. So if you're missing vision in childhood, then may, vision may not develop normally neurologically. In older children, um, academic performance suffers. In the adults and elderly, affects activities of daily living and all kinds of manifestations for that. For me, it was just headaches. I couldn't tell that I had a visual problem, but I was having optic migraines all the time. That's when I know I need a new prescription is the optic migraine start again. I actually have 20-20 vision. It's kind of unfair. <laughs> I know. It's just delicate like a flower. Eyeballs. Just delicate. My eyes can't handle things. Okay, so when we have this cornea and lens, the goal is to focus light on the retina. The simplest thing to have messed up is an error of refraction. It just means that we are unable to focus light on that retina. It could be an irregular curvature of the cornea, and we call that astigmatism. And in that case, things are going to be slightly deformed in the field of view. What's up? So um, errors of refraction, nearsightedness and farsightedness. Um, so let me make sure I'm saying this the right way. If you are nearsighted, you can see near, you can't see far. If you are farsighted, you can see far, you cannot see near, as I understand it. I might I get that backwards sometimes, but I think I got that right. Um, so basically, it means you need to go get your prescription checked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Prescriptions change all the time, though. Yeah. That's why they, they check you every year. Mine's changed every time I've gone in. And like huge change, like what the heck was I looking at before? Uh, so it just means that the curvature of your lens is inadequate to focus that light. It's either focusing too far back or too near. Sometimes that's related to the shape of your eyeball. So maybe the lens is fine, but your eyeball shape is too, let's say, narrow. And so that, that light is technically focusing behind it is what we say in the physics sense of the word. Or it's too long and, and it's uh, focusing ahead of it in the physics sense of the word. So we use corrective lenses with the opposite curvature to compensate and direct the light to the correct place. Now it's a little bit different than the sort of vision loss you get with simple age. Uh, Part of this process we call accommodation, our ability to change our lens and our pupil size in response to light and visual changes. While things are getting closer to your face or farther from your face, we are accommodating that proximity of that thing. And that is a very, very fast activity, especially when you're young and healthy. But as you age, you lose flexibility of those structures. You lose flexibility of the ligaments, strength of the muscles, uh, elasticity of that lens. So usually when it's a loss of accommodation, presbyopia, uh, you're going to have trouble with near objects. That's when your grandma starts holding things up to here to look at them, right? And like I said, astigmatism is irregularity. Most likely the cornea, sometimes the lens can be irregular as well. I also have astigmatism on this plane. It's this way. Uh, there you go. And again, just the opposite curvature for the lens to compensate. So everything slows down with age. Uh, visual acuity is going to decrease. Sensitivity is going to decrease. Accommodation is going to decrease. Slowing of dark adaptation. Walking into a dark room, it's going to take your pupils a longer time to dilate. Stepping into the light, it's going to take your pupils longer to constrict. 
And that presents a safety hazard in both directions. Cataracts is age-related clouding of the lens. It physically looks kind of pretty, uh, but it's not going to be good for vision. I, one thing that I've heard from people with cataracts is that things appear more yellow than they used to. There's actually a school of thought that thinks that Van Gogh might have had de developed cataracts because if you look at his early work, it's very blue. And if you look at his later work, it's very yellow. That's a hypothesis. There's probably other reasons for that. We can remove that opacity and replace part of the lens. So now let's talk about some retinopathies. A retinopathy is any disorder that impacts the retina. Now remember, I had you learn the tunics. But these are layers, layer, 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 three layers. And each layer is connected to the other layers via basically a thin layer of connective tissue. So retinal detachment means we got a small tear between the retina and the choroid layer. And now we've got this big vitreous fluid that's actually going to seep behind that retina. And more and more of it can seep behind the retina. And as it goes back there, it tears the retina the rest of the way off. So one thing this may be described as is a curtain is being pulled down over my eyes. The curtain's coming down on the world. Once that retinal detachment is complete, that can be complete blindness that may not be uh, fixable at that stage. So early on, if we catch that tear before complete retinal detachment, we can generally fix that. Close that tear in the retina before it has a chance to completely collapse. And you guys did your cow eye dissection, so maybe you'll remember how easy it was to scrape that retina off. Does anybody remember the genetic disorder that might, might potentially lead to retinal detachment that we covered in week one? This guy with the stretchy limbs, yes. That was very well said. Marfan syndrome, exactly. So connective tissue disorders. If somebody has an underlying connective tissue disorder, then they're more likely to experience retinal detachment. Not that that's the only pathway for that to happen, but that's one of them. Diabetic retinopathy, this is an extreme case, nevertheless. Yeah, that's not a good retinopathy. Your eyes rely on microvasculature to work. Surprise. It's a very vascular organ. <laughs> uh, not in exactly the same way as your liver, but still. It is very vascular, and um, you have many, many capillary beds in your retina. And if you have diabetes, that is uncontrolled blood sugar, whether it's mellitus type 1, mellitus type 2, um, then yeah, you're going to develop some microaneurysms. You may have some small-scale hemorrhages on that retina. And that's why diabetes can lead to blindness. Age-related macular degeneration is when uh, you were told not to stare directly at the sun during a solar eclipse, but you did anyway. <laughs> so it's progressive. It's loss of central vision due to changes of the macula and retina. Again, it's kind of wear and tear related. You know, you glance at the sun one too many times, you look into a laser, your friend points a laser into your eye, whatever it is. Right? We all have that, that friend who just just like, hey, hey, hey. Yeah. Um, so we can use an Amsler grid to assess that. So this, was, this would be you're looking at the normal grid. This is what somebody with a retinopathy would maybe see, maybe age-related macular degeneration. Yeah, like a black hole is sucking it in. Some great deformation happening there. OK, let's hit those glaucomas, because I know that this is related to all of your pharmacology. You've got this contraindication on pretty much everything, right? So let's see why that's contraindicated by just about everything, shall we? So there's two major forms of glaucoma. They are called open angle glaucoma and closed angle glaucoma. Which one's scarier? Closed angle. <laughs> closed angle. So here's closed angle glaucoma. The angle we're talking about is the angle between the iris and the cornea. 
And that is the gateway for that aqueous humor to get back to the canal of Schlem. Schlem. Shall I repeat it again? Schlem. There we go. Just a little bit like phlegm. There is a, a nice little like, oh, it's this the sclera venous sinus. Like, it's a lot nicer sounding. But uh, I like saying canal of phlegm, so here we are. So now remember, our pathways that we're synthesizing here in the ciliary body, and then we're going through the pupil circulating into the anterior chamber and back into the canal of phlegm for reabsorption. You can see in your closed angle glaucoma here, we're blocking off the exit path for it. So this is effectively obstructing that canal, that drainage. Whereas with our open angle glaucoma, we do have overabundant aqueous humor. So both of these, we have too much aqueous humor in these spaces, and it's increasing your intraocular pressure. And that's rather dangerous on its own, right? Painful and dangerous. In the case of closed angle glaucoma, not only do you have overabundant, but it does not have an exit route. Whereas in open angle glaucoma, you have too much aqueous humor, but it has an exit route. So one of the reasons that it's contraindicated for a lot of drugs, a lot of drugs are going to alter your rate of aqueous humor synthesis. When I looked into this to try to help people out with the farm class back in the day, I found a lot of steroids that increase the rate of formation of aqueous humor. Is that tracking with what you guys have seen so far? I think, can you think all the respiratory stuff? Hypertension stuff, yeah. So things that affect fluid volume and things like that. Absolutely. Okay, so acute angle closure glaucoma is a medical emergency. Severe eye pain, nausea and vomiting, blurred vision, halos around lights, red eye, dilated pupil, non-reactive to light. And as mentioned before, there's a variety of ways to have visual field loss. This one's going to represent your macular degeneration like we've already seen. That's technically a visual field loss as well. But you can also have something anywhere along this pathway. So when you're looking at these different lesions, these are all brain lesions being represented by these red lines. Uh, when you start to assess what this lesion is going to do, what you do is you trace it back to the eye and trace that back to the part of the field of view. So you go this direction in order to figure out what this is doing. So if I had just this, uh, we've got one, two, three, four, five here. So which one is being represented here? So follow it this way and follow that out to the visual field. Two. So this person would have this visual field deficit. What about that optic chiasm? Let's say you had a pituitary tumor. So you trace that back. So that would be three. So lateral, or sometimes we refer to that as the temporal visual field. So nasal versus temporal. Temporal visual field. What about if you had a, an aneurysm of the carotid artery right here? Four. And what if you're way back here? I'm doing them in order, so it's fine. So left visual field. For both the right and left eye, the left visual field is gone. So even if you cover this one, left field of view is gone. If you cover this one, left field of view is gone. And if you want any more work on why that makes sense, let me know. Because this is a process. This took me a while to figure out when I was in grad school. Uh, because of that optic chiasm, so this has... This is the right side of the brain. This is the left field of view from both sides at that point. After the optic chiasm, the same side visual field goes to the contralateral side of the brain. It's cool stuff, right? Yeah, it does make sense. It made sense when I was being lectured on it, and then I went to lab, and I couldn't make it make sense in lab until I'd worked on it for like eight solid hours. So just be aware of that. It, it took me a while. And now I have it, and I'm like, yay, everybody should know it. <laughs>
And we're kind of exiting our special senses here with smell and taste. Remember that olfactory, um, I've been trying to keep this consistent between A and P1, 2, and 3. Olfaction really goes through a few different places. But we're just going to put it on that vasomedial frontal lobe again, just to be consistent. It's got a few pathways. It's going to have uh, some places like the temporal lobe, maybe a little bit that it goes to. But we're just going to be consistent with A and P1 and 2 and say vasomedial frontal lobe. And then gustatory, which again, this is a little inconsistent from what I taught you in A and P1, which bothers me a little bit. Yes, you've got some taste on your parietal lobe, but where was your main gustatory cortex? <laughs> no, it's, there is some on the parietal, but that's not where your primary gustatory cortex is. It's not pictured. I promise we learned this. What part of what gyrus? Hmm? Nope, sensory is parietal. What's up? Nope. You have your frontal lobe, your parietal lobe, your temporal lobe, your occipital lobe, and your, we already said temporal lobe. What's your secret fifth lobe? Should I pause while you guys figure it out? In for the win again, insular cortex. Yeah, she's on fire today. That's your gustatory cortex. It's on your insula, which is why I took this brain apart right here. here. So you peel away that temporal lobe on that lateral fissure, right? And then there's more cortex in there. It is hiding. And that's where your gustatory cortex actually is. And yes, you have some components for taste on your parietal, but we're not going to worry about it. Okay, so disorders of smell and taste. Once again, these are neurological pathways, so you can have brain lesions that would impact either one of these. There's going to be a safety issue when people lose their sense of smell. It is kind of typical for people to literally just traumatize their olfactory epithelium over the lifespan. And every time you damage your olfactory epithelium, your respiratory epithelium, which does not have nerves, is going to encroach until you have less and less olfactory epithelium with age. So it is very common for the elderly population to have a poor sense of smell. We call that hyponosmia. Where are the safety issues? Carbon monoxide. I mean, carbon monoxide doesn't smell anything like anything by itself. Being, not being able to smell smoke or fire, absolutely. That's a safety risk. Food, spoilage of food, not being able to tell that your milk is, is spoiled, drinking it and getting a nice GI infection when you're already elderly. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> if you're going to have gangrene, you probably don't want to smell it. That having been said, if you can't tell that it's infected or how serious it is, uh, one last safety issue, a little bit subtler than the rest of these. Let's say you're an old person with high blood pressure and you don't have much of a sense of smell. You're going to oversalt your food, try, try to compensate for the lack of flavor. Yeah, maybe you're just eating hard candies. Is that going to be very good for your blood pressure? It is not. We're almost there, guys. We're so close. Okay, uh, pain. In order to sense and experience pain, we're going to have four steps. Transduction, transmission, perception, and modulation. When we mean transduction, if you're a physics or electronics person, then you know, might know what a transducer is. Transduction is when we change from one type of energy to another type of energy. In this case, we're changing from a mechanical deformation in the skin you got cut or punched or whatever, that mechanically deformed the sensory receptors in your skin 
and that mechanical deformation of those sensory receptors sent action potentials which are electrical. That's transduction, mechanical to electrical. That's the part that nobody catches is transduction phase. So Sure. Like a transformer. I mean, trans just means different from. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the first action potentials along the sensory neuron are transduced from mechanical deformation. And you already know that about your Pacinian corpuscles, lamellated corpuscles, oh, those are the same thing. Your nociceptors, right? You detect pain because there's a mechanical change to that sensory nerve end. You detected everything. And then it went through your pain pathway. Which of your three pathways is the one for pain? I taught you three pathways. What's up? There are three pathways that I taught in our neuroscience unit that most people in undergrad AMP should teach. I don't know if everybody got them or not. Three major pathways related to this two sensory and one motor pathway. We already covered the motor pathway today. Does anybody remember what that was called? When we were talking about ALS, we talked about corticospinal pathway is the motor one. So it's not that. CST was one. What were the other two called? SCT for pain, spinal thalamic. And if you learned it from somebody else, you may have learned it as anterolateral pathway or anterolateral system. They all mean the same thing. It's your pain pathway. So this is the transmission phase. We're transmitting action potentials. It's coming along through that dorsal root, through the dorsal gray horn, because sensory is dorsal, motor is ventral. We're going to decusate at the level or near the level of that spinal nerve coming into the spinal cord. Decusates immediately which has clinical correlations. And then it ascends to the brain, to the um, thalamus, and that's going to be its last synapse before it hits what cortex? And I kind of heard some people muttering this cortex for reception of pain. Somatosensory cortex on the postcentral gyrus. Well done. So that was transduction. Then we transmitted it to the brain. Now the brain can perceive it. Perception has to occur with interneurons in the central nervous system. So perception is happening in the brain. And now there's a fourth phase of modulation. You actually have some uh, casually referred to as descending pathways, uh, more formally efferent pathways, that actually modify our perception of our own pain. So the endocannabinoid system, the encephalinergic system, the um, endorphin system are gonna modulate your perception of pain so that even if you're being crushed by a car, these pain modulating systems will kick in pretty quickly and suppress those and alter them. We've probably never talked about the encephalin pathway before. You've probably heard of endorphins though, right? So fun fact about endorphin. Break this down linguistically. Endorphin, endogenous morphine. Oh, oh yeah, you oh, exercise, you get endorphins. That's right, okay. Um, so we discovered morphine before we discovered the endogenous system that modulates our pain naturally. So we named our pain modulating chemicals after morphine. Cool, right? Endorphins are just endogenous morphine. Which is the same thing for the endocannabinoid system. We discovered the cannabinoids, like THC, and then we're like, hey, our body makes cannabinoids too. And then we call them endocannabinoids. Yeah. Science. All right, here's our other takeaway for our pain system. This is going to be on your worksheet. The difference between uh, the perception of sharp, stinging, cutting, pinching pain versus dull, burning, aching pain is the type of nerve fiber that carries that information. And so we've labeled the ones that 
carry the sharp pain. We're going to call them alpha fibers. They're going to be myelinated. They're going to be fast traveling. That myelin sheath is going to make them faster, right? So thermal stimuli, mechanical stimuli will tend to go through these um, A, you know what, there's another name for that. I need to look up what that is, that, those A fibers. So dull, burning, aching pain, those are actually going to use physiologically unmyelinated fibers. I've kind of avoided this topic throughout neuro that, yeah, you need a myelin sheath. We need to transmit action potentials. Demyelinating disorders are bad. So I've kind of avoided this idea that you have physiologically unmyelinated axons that just naturally occur, right? So your C fibers are unmyelinated pathways. Uh, they are slower traveling because they are unmyelinated. Remember that part of the purpose of the myelin sheath is to speed up the rate of saltatory conduction, right? Instead of having action potentials all the way down that axon, we get to skip whole portions and have action potential, action potential, and then we're done, right? Whereas an unmyelinated, every time we transmit information, it happens to happen all every step of the way. So more of your fibers are actually your C fibers, 90% of them are C fibers. So you're going to be much more perceptive to that dull aching pain than you are to the sharp pain. And that's really it. Um, just a reminder about visceral versus parietal pain, where uh, our body wall pain is going to be very well localized along dermatomes, which is why that horrible picture is there. If anybody's having some, some flashbacks to AMP1 right now, where we listen to the dermatome rap. We can listen to it again if you want. Traumatize a whole new generation of people who didn't have to take it. Um, so again, that's well localized if it's body wall, if it's extremities, poorly localized if it's visceral. And as you already know, that visceral innervation can tag along to dermatomes after ascending or descending, and that's going to be the source of our referred pain. Uh, that's about it. So there's physiologic pain. If there's a tissue injury that has occurred and that information is being sent to your brain and you are receiving it and transmitting it, or not transmitting it, modulating it, perceiving it, that's physiologic. There's also pathologic pain. It could be that there's improper activation of your pain pathways. You could be perceiving pain that has no physiologic source, and we would call that pathologic pain. And that's it. We're done. Any questions?